Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of 10 webinars that the Oregon Office of Rural Health is hosting, uh, which are focused on critical access hospital finance and operations. Today's webinar is PIEC 101, Transitioning to a Performance Improvement Executive Committee. I'm Sarah Anderson, the Director of Field Services at the Oregon Office of Rural Health. Uh, Jonathan, can you please move the slide forward? Uh, before we get started, I'm going to go over a few logistics. The audio has been muted and the video is turned off for all attendees. Um, to uh, select the ellipsis on the right of your screen to populate the chat feature. And we ask that you use this feature to ask your questions, which you can put into the chat throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll monitor it and ask questions of Jonathan after he's done with his presentation. Um, you can also raise your hand by clicking at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's a little hand icon there, and then we can unmute you and you can ask your question live. The presentation slides and recording will be posted shortly after the session, uh, likely on Monday, actually, um, on our website at the link on the slide. And I'll put that same link in the chat in just a moment here. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned a moment ago, this is the third in a series of 10 webinars that we're hosting with a focus on CA finance and operations. You'll see the next seven webinars listed on this slide, um, and you can find more information as well as uh, recordings of our last two sessions on the ORH website uh, with the link that I'm gonna put in the chat in just a moment. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our speaker. With us today is Jonathan Pattenberg, who is a principal at Wintergreen. He's an accomplished, results-driven senior executive with nearly 20 years of progressively responsible experience advising nonprofit, for-profit, and government entities. Over the past six years, Jonathan has worked with entities ranging from independent practices to multi-state healthcare systems on how to leverage rural opportunities to improve financial and operational performance. Prior to that, Jonathan served as Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer for a 21-bed nonprofit critical access hospital. I'd like to welcome you back, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much for being here to share your expertise, and I will turn it over to you now. Thanks, Sarah, and excited to present on this information today. Now, when we talk about performance improvement, performance improvement means something different depending upon who you ask and who you're talking to within the healthcare industry. Now, when we talk about performance improvement, it's coming to the understanding that performance improvement, the ultimate goal of that is to really drive performance, to increase our financial position, to increase patient satisfaction, outcomes, clinical competencies, all of these additional things roll up into performance improvement. Now, when we talk about performance improvement within an organization, it's the realization also that there is no one size fits all approach. Because there are varying staff, services, financial position, and all of these additional things, as we start to evaluate performance improvement, we have to realize that it's the nuances within the environment that we operate that ultimately can drive our ability to achieve whatever we are setting as our organizational goals. Now, I know I've used this a couple times already, and when we talk about a performance improvement model, it's really around the foundation of driving everything back to that value to the community. Now, when we talk about value to the community, the goal is, is to really substantiate the services and as critical access hospitals or rural health clinics or those entities that are really providing services in rural communities, it's the realization that we are truly safety net providers. And oftentimes, if we are not there to provide those services, then that patient population within that service area will have to travel to other regions to get those services. So again, we don't wanna do anything that can jeopardize the services that we're delivering within our primary and secondary service area. Now, when we talk about that value to the community, again, it all rolls back to the two fundamental areas of strategy versus operations. Now, strategy is what dictates the overall direction and goals for the organization. And then the operations are those that are really being done to accomplish that broader strategy and to serve that patient population. Now, I can tell you with traveling to hospitals across the country, there's often a disconnect between the overall strategy and the operations itself. 
And a lot of times this comes down to a limitation in the strategy of truly understanding what we can operationalize on a day-to-day -day perspective. In addition to that, when we talk about the different segments on the operations side, we really break it down into two fundamental areas. We have finance and we have quality. <clears throat> now, when we talk about operations in today's environment, particularly an environment where we've seen increasing costs and really stagnant reimbursements, what we're tending to do more as organizations is focus more on the cost structure of those organizations and not looking at ways that we can ultimately drive incremental revenue and reimbursements to our facility by focusing on revenue capture and gains. So what we really have to start to do is we have to look at opportunities as to how we can start to merge quality and finance into a single collective unit that is focused on performance improvement across the organization realizing that in today's environment quality has a direct impact on finance and financial performance has a direct impact on what we can afford to do and sustain to do on a quality perspective if we're struggling financially as an organization we may not be able to bring in that additional care worker or bring in additional nurses or whatever else the case may be on the inverse of that if we have poor quality outcomes patients are less likely to come back to our facility to receive services and again, that will impact the financial performance of our organization going forward. <clears throat> so what we have to start to do is work together as a collective and start to drive the linkages across those two units of being finance and quality. Now, when we talk about the healthcare environment and we look across the industry, it's one of the most segmented or siloed industries out there. We have quality and finance. We have admit administration and non-admin. We have providers and nurses. We have clinical, non-clinical. Again, we have all of these different areas that is segmented within the healthcare industry. Now, even if you have a good working relationship between quality and finance, does not mean you won't have segmenting between admin and non-admin, or again, nurses and providers. You have to start to look at all of those different functional areas and realize the linkages across those different functional areas as a way to start to drive performance improvement. Now, what I can tell you also is that if we do not start breaking down those barriers and creating those linkages, we will not realize the operational efficiencies that we could in a rural market and rural environment. <clears throat> so what we have to do as an organization is to realize that as a way to improve financial solvency going forward and to improve our net position, we have to start to realize the efficiencies and start working together across those collective entities. I've been to many hospitals before where they focus predominantly on financial, or maybe you have a leader that is of a clinical nature that wants to focus very much on the quality side. You cannot put one side above the other and have to realize that both sides, quality and finance, patient outcome, satisfaction, all of those different things roll up and have to be focused on as a part of performance improvement. Now, when we talk about performance improvement also, we have to realize that we have to start to create these multidisciplinary teams that breaks down those barriers and silos and has revenue cycle involved with finance people, involved with clinical people, involved with case management, care workers, all of those different areas have to start collaborating and working together. Now, when we talk about performance improvement, we have to realize also that performance improvement involves many different areas. And what we've seen with organizations is oftentimes they may focus just on financial or just on operating or just on value, and they overlook the other areas. Now, even though we can segment different aspects of performance improvement into major functional areas, there are direct linkages and overlaps among all those areas that has a direct impact on each of the other areas. For instance, if we look at payer contracts and do payer contract reviews, payer contract has a direct impact on reimbursements we receive as an organization. If we focus on population-based strategies and we start getting patients out of our facility, that will also impact financial. As we look at staffing matrices and we look at the services we're providing and demand-based staffing tools, again, that will impact financial performance and value and all of that. So we have to start to realize that there are linkages across all of these performance improvement categories and start to work from that perspective to drive performance improvement going forward. Now, where did we get to where we are now? 
Now, when we look across the evolution of improvement models, and we go back to the 80s, it was very much segmented between quality, revenue cycle, and finance. Now, when we look at the segmenting of the industry, even though it was segmented, we had to find different ways to work across and blend those different groups. Unfortunately, when we went back to the 80s, each one of those operated in their different siloed perspectives. Now, as we go back to that point in the 80s, there was different cost structures, there was different reimbursement methodologies, all of those effectuated the ability to provide services and to maintain solvency. As we got to today's environment where the cost of care has continued to drastically outpace reimbursements received, in addition, the administrative burden and care requirements have also continued to drastically increase over the past 40 years, we've continued to see an environment where we are starting to be taxed as organizations and the ability to sustain services going forward. So how did we get to where a PIEC is really the gold standard in today's environment and is allowing those organizations to implement this concept to outpace or outperform those that are not focusing on this concept? So again, if we go back to the 80s, it was divided among quality assurance, revenue cycle, and budgets and statements on the finance side. When we got to the 90s, really not much changed. Everything really remained segmented. Quality assurance changed into quality improvement, but nonetheless, we were still operating within those separate segmented silos. It wasn't until we got to 2000, and really it was precipitated by the fact that organizations were starting to struggle based on their financial performance. Again, we saw the advent of the critical access hospital. We saw other programs and revenue opportunities starting to take off. But we also saw a merging of revenue cycle and finance to really start to realize that revenue cycle, claims capture, adjudication, self-pay, uh, point of service collections, all of those additional things had a direct impact on financial performance. So what we did is we merged those two groups together under the understanding that revenue cycle had a direct impact on financial performance, budget statements, and all of those different things. However, quality very much still stayed segmented and was focused on performance improvement within the quality realm. It wasn't until today's time that we really started to see a merging of quality and finance into a single collective performance improvement initiative focused on the betterment of the entity as a whole, again, under the realization that quality has a direct impact on finance and finance has a direct impact on quality. Unfortunately, we continue to operate in an environment where an overwhelming majority of organizations still have a siloing of quality and revenue cycle. And I'll give you an example of how some of these efficiencies, inefficiencies create an environment that leads to additional work and negative outcomes from a revenue perspective. Now, oftentimes we operate in environments where our coders are not directly engaged with our providers or our providers are not keeping track of all the documentation requirements necessary for a coding and substantiation of the billing of services. Now, by not getting our providers directly involved in a revenue cycle committee, we're creating an environment where revenue cycle staff and those that are not involved with the delivery of care are having to engage providers around the services they're delivering and the documentation of those services. Now, if we had a chief medical officer or medical director automatically integrated into our revenue cycle committee, or we had the broader performance improvement committee, anytime there was an issue with provider documentation or follow-up or you know, things related to those aspects, we could then charge that CMO or provider to then go work with the other providers around the issues that are impacting the financial performance of the organization or the claims adjudication or dropping of charges or whatever else the case may be. You know, me as a former CFO, I remember situations where I would try to talk to a provider, and I'm sure many of you have heard the situation also where a provider could very easily come back and say, well, you're not a provider, you just don't understand what we're going through or the nuances of having to do all these additional things. So again, integrating a provider into your revenue cycle committee or bringing along that broader PIEC, it allows you to functionally assign different things to those that can actually cause or effectuate change more effectively than those that are not involved in that area. So again, start to pull in the individuals that can actually drive change in that area. 
Now, what are the different characteristics or different ways of developing and implementing a plan? Now, what are, when we talk about the five characteristics of an improvement plan, we really have to start to evaluate the effect on the overall organization. Now, one of the biggest overlooked areas relative to performance improvement, I would say, is the leveraging of one of our most valuable assets that we have as a hospital. And that's really leveraging the data that we have as a hospital or as a rural health clinic or as whatever type of entity we're operating within as a healthcare entity to leverage that information to drive performance improvement going forward. <clears throat> Oftentimes we overlook the data and don't leverage that as a means to drive performance improvement. Now, what I mean by this when we're looking at data is it's pulling that information and determining either KPIs or metrics that can actually be substantiated and driven by the data that we have within our organization. Maybe it'll drive expansion of services into an area or it can drive revenue cycle or performance improvement but we have to start leveraging the data to drive measurable outcomes to ensure that we're positioning ourselves effectively and achieving the goals that we're looking to set. What we also have to do is focus on the linkages and efficiencies across the organization as a whole. Again, there's oftentimes a disconnect, not only within our own organization, but also within the services that we're delivering and what our patient population is expecting from those services. Now, when we talk about overall performance improvement, again, we have to evaluate performance improvement under the realization that coming together as an organization and realizing that we're merging quality and finance to select the metrics, we'll start to improve ourselves as an organization. And I'll give you an example. I may have mentioned this during a prior webinar, but when we talk about performance improvement, I was at a hospital and they had ended up establishing different performance metrics, both on the quality side and on the finance side as a part of revenue cycle. Now, when they started looking at those metrics, the two sides had never talked to each other to the point that they could realize that for one side to achieve their metrics, the other side would have had to fail and not achieve their metric. And on the finance side, if finance was to achieve their metric, there wouldn't have been adequate resources and funding to actually supplement and to provide the services that was pushed for on a metric on the quality side. Again, we have to realize that we're ultimately rolling everything up to that value to the community and the goals that we establish and the KPIs and the different tracking of measurement has to ensure that they roll up across the organization. We cannot implement metrics that on one side allows us to be successful at the detriment to the other side. Now, the last area that we also have to realize is that when we're implementing a performance improvement model, we have to realize that responsibility is shared across the organization. No single person can be responsible for the broader performance improvement efforts within the organization. There is no single person within an organization that can effectuate that much change and has that much understanding of every single thing that's going on that they can start to effectuate that change more broadly across the organization. We have to realize that we have to pull in people across leadership, frontline staff, providers, all of these different areas if we truly want to establish a performance improvement culture within our organization. It is not something that we can drive from the top down and expect accountability and performance and gains across the organization. Again, we have to start looking at these different areas. Now, when we talk about an overall improvement structure, now, again, all of these things will fit into the performance improvement collective. And before I get into that, I'm just laying the foundation of different things that we have to start to realize and integrate as foundational components of that broader performance improvement. Now, the first thing that we really have to do is define what quality means for the organization. This is something that varies across organizations. And we really have to tie that back to the broader strategy of the organization under the realization of the services that we provide, the people that are there to provide those services, and what we are trying to accomplish as an organization. Now, if we were an organization that was fully integrated into an ACO focused on population-based initiatives and all of those additional things, quality for us is something that may be fundamentally different then a critical access hospital that is not involved in an ACO and not involved in all those population-based initiatives. So even though we may have like organizations across the industry, 
the definition of quality is something that we have to define as a way to establish that broader PIEC initiative. We also have to establish an accountability structure. Now, when we talk about accountability, I really like to say accountability is, is broken down into three different areas. You either have no accountability, forced accountability, or a culture of accountability. Now, as we evaluate most organizations, I would say most organizations hover somewhere between no accountability and forced accountability. Very few organizations will ever really get to, especially in today's environment, to truly a culture of accountability if they haven't focused on different ways to drive performance improvement across the collective of the entire organization. Now, what are the differences between the two or the three? Now, no accountability is pretty much self-evident. That means that we don't have an accountable structure within our organization and that there really are no benchmarks, there's no performance improvement initiatives, and people aren't really held to standards of achieving those performance improvement initiatives within that hospital. The next is forced accountability, and we oftentimes see this within organizations, particularly smaller organizations. Forced accountability is where you have either a senior leadership team or a bunch of directors at a senior level that establish all of the performance improvement goals for that organization and then force that down throughout the organization. Again, frontline staff have no feedback or no input into the selection of the metrics. They're not involved in the processes involved in approving the metrics and so forth. So that's very much a force down. Now in a force down environment, you can be successful as an organization, but the culture will at some point suffer to that degree because as you start losing certain individuals in a culture of forced accountability, you have are always at risk of losing an individual that is driving a significant initiative at that organization. And the unfortunate consideration that you may take a step back if you lose that person. Now, in a culture of accountability, these are the ones that truly outperform those other organizations. In a culture of accountability, every single person within the organization broadly accepts what they are responsible for. They're not having to have somebody constantly come after them and tell them how to do their functional responsibilities. They realize what their measures are, they realize what they have to do, and they perform within that environment. They're also included in the process of selecting metrics and performance improvement and process improvement, realizing that, again, the frontline staff are those the ones that are directly engaging with the patients. They're the ones that directly providing the services at the hospital, we want to include them as a part of the performance improvement initiative. And again, when we talk about the PIEC concept, it's the realization that it's a broad complement across the organization of leaders and frontline staff and providers and so forth as a way to drive that performance improvement. Now, when we talk about, again, the structure, it's very much founded on the approach of leveraging data to drive performance improvement. What we have to do is as we establish performance improvement goals, there's some key fundamental things that we have to build into that performance improvement initiative. One, we have to have a metric that we can actually measure. If we can't measure a metric or an outcome or some type of performance improvement initiative, how do we know if we're actually improving or achieving the goals that we've established as a part of that improvement initiative? And then the second main component of that also is there has to be a specified timeline for when we want to improve that goal or achieve that goal by. Again, if it's open-ended, we can always kick the can down the road as to when we want to accomplish that metric. The last thing that I would say around this also is what we need to do is we need to realize that we also have to continue to rotate our performance metrics. Oftentimes organizations will get stagnant on the metrics that they are selecting. And we have a goal of, you know, oh, we want to achieve 100% hand hygiene, and that's been our goal for the past 20 years. Or we want to achieve net days 45 AR, and that's been our goal for the last 30 years. We have to come to the realization also that we have to modify our goals, because if we continue to focus on the same goals, they continue to move to a back burner, and they are no longer a focus for the organization. The last thing also around the program structure I would like to say is that we also have to focus on both macro and micro metrics. And what organizations often do is they will focus on micro metrics to drive broader performance of the organization, and they will focus on macro metrics to drive individual day-to-day -day operations. 
And what happens is, is that we have to select both the macro and micro metrics as we're establishing this PIC to drive broader performance improvement. Now, if we only select macro metrics, and I'll use net days AR as an example, if we only use macro metrics to select something or to identify something, say we want to establish a net days AR 45 days. Now, there are 300 different things that go into establishing that net days AR. There's clean claims rate, first pass rate, DNFB, there's claims denials, there's all of these additional things that it's impossible to actually determine when we're looking at something as just as as large as net days AR, what is actually causing an impact to that number. So what we have to do is we can focus on something like net days AR as a large overarching goal, but we should focus on other things such as clean claim ratios, first pass ratios, DNFB, DNFC. Again, all of these additional things as a way to drive performance improvement. Only through the blending of micro and macro metrics can we truly start to improve performance as an organization under the realization that certain things we have to get granular in and other things we wanna know about the broader organization. Now, what are the influences on program effectiveness? Now, all of you have been in hospital leadership and at organizations for a while, and there's many countless things that can influence overall program effectiveness. And again, oftentimes, one of the overarching things is the relations that we have within the facility and the willingness of those employees and individuals to really drive broader performance improvement at the organization. Now, when we talk about this, the influences on program effectiveness, it's the services, the financial position, the access to resources, the budget, political environment, the providers we have, the age of the facility, public perspective of what they think of the organization. All of these things have a direct impact on the effectiveness of our program. And what we have to start to realize is the identification of the different barriers that are preventing us from being effective as an organization and starting to establish those performance improvement plans as a way to drive performance improvement and overall gains. Again, the overarching goal is to continue to ensure that we continue to serve as that vital safety net provider for our rural communities. Now, what are some of the pros and cons of current structures? And when we talk about the current structure of the siloing between revenue cycle and clinical and quality improvement and so forth, that's what I'm talking about when we talk about the advantages of the current structure. Now, oftentimes when we talk about that current structure, it is easier for staff to learn under that current structure. Again, not having to teach a bunch of clinical people about financials and reimbursement and all that is a lot easier. It's the same thing, me as a CFO, or former CFO, I did not know about all of the clinical expectations and outcomes and care delivery requirements and all that. So teaching me as a CFO would take a lot of time and patience on our care team to explain to me coming together as to how we can work in that environment. Again, it does not require staff to focus on things outside of their core functions. Also, in addition to that, because you have staff that are only clinical or only financial, you can drill down to a much more granular level when you're focusing on certain initiatives. Now, what I will tell you also is, even though that's also an advantage, that can also be a disadvantage because you can tend to go down individual rabbit holes and get very focused on a specific thing and miss the broader things that are driving organizational performance as a whole. The last thing is really, it can lead to several metrics and performance improvement initiatives due to the limited focus of each group. Again, if you're operating three or four different groups and each group selects 10 different metrics, at the end of the day, you can hear 40 different metrics based on each of the different groups. Regardless of whether those overlap with one another, or whether, regardless of whether or not the passing of one leads to the detriment of the other, again, you can have a significant number of metrics and things that you're looking at when you're actually establishing multiple groups. Now, what are some of the disadvantages of these different structures, that current foundation? Now, I'm sure everybody on this webinar today can say, you know what, I attend too many meetings at my hospital or too many meetings at, the cl at my clinic. Now, when we operate in this siloed approach, again, because many of us wear multiple hats, me as my organization, I was the CFO, the COO, I also oversaw the IT network, I also did other things at the hospital, you get pulled into different areas and many different meetings. 
Now, what happens is, is that when you get pulled into those meetings, unfortunately, you're not able to focus much on process improvement, performance improvement, and actual things that can effectuate outcomes for the organization. You're focused on going from fire to fire to fire or meeting to meeting to meeting at that hospital that you're not able to drive that performance improvement. You also continue to operate in distinct silos under that prior methodology. Again, continuing to operate under a distinct quality and distinct revenue cycle, you will continue to operate in that environment and you will lack the ability to create efficiencies within the organization. You will also lack transparency across the organization as each entity continues to focus only on the discrete areas of their focus, they will not be able to understand the things that are going on in the rest of the hospital. Again, if we're having material impacts in revenue cycle relative to provider documentation, but we're unable to effectively share that with the providers or with those on the quality side, that'll impact us negatively from a financial performance. But I would say that the biggest disadvantage is the fact that really in this environment, we operate as distinct units or actually separate entities almost to a degree where quality is providing the patient care and finance is trying to get us reimbursed for the services that we're providing. But beyond that, we are really operating as separate businesses to that degree. We have to start to break that down. We will realize efficiencies, we will realize savings in time, and we will also realize uh, reimbursement advantages when we look at it to that degree. So what is laying the foundation? and What are we trying to accomplish as we look at this PIEC? Now, this is not in sequential order uh, of uh, looking at it. Again, it's just the identification of the different functional areas within our organization. Now, at the very top, we do have our board of directors and board of governors, you know, whatever our governance team is, that is established over the overarching organization. Now, our board of directors is ultimately responsible for ensuring accountability within the organization. Now, what we have to do is to ensure also that as that board is responsible for ensuring accountability within the organization, oftentimes boards will get into the day-to-day -day operations of the organization itself. And what we have to do is by establishing this PIEC, we are able to provide the board with the information necessary to drive broader strategy and governance without them having to feel like they have to get into the day-to-day -day operations. So again, establish that PIEC even from that framework. We have our executive management team, which is really responsible for the coordination of services across the hospital and the coordination of pulling together finance and quality. We have our medical executive committee or provider committee or whatever we call it within our organization. That is ultimately responsible for establishing the privileges and the guidance and the services that we can provide and really the framework around what we can do as a hospital. Now, the next level is that PIEC, that Performance Improvement Executive Collaborative. Now, this group is coming together and really coming together to establish the framework for that organization but also to evaluate the effectiveness of the different reporting entities within that organization. Now, the goal of the PIEC is not to drive all strategy and not all performance improvement of the organization. It's really a collective and a group of people that come together to determine the effectiveness. Again, as you start to establish that PIEC, you are gonna task out much of the day-to-day -day improvement efforts to specific task groups, reporting entities, committees, and so forth. Now, the reporting entities are those units within the hospital. And think of them like your emergency department, think of them like your rural health clinic, the inpatient unit, revenue cycle, and so forth. These are all of the organizations that are really responsible for the day-to-day -day functions and the improvement itself. So when we talk about the reporting entities, those are the organizations or units that are gonna report that information back up to the PIEC to drive things going forward. And then the last group is really the committees. Now, I'm sure all of us sit on countless committees within the organization. As we talk about those committees and we talk about the organization, the committees are really tasked with the organizational approach and compliance relative to the different standards set within the hospital. And really they work together. And these are the groups that can span multiple departments and multiple areas to start to pull together and drive performance improvement initiatives. Now, when we talk about the governance and management committees, 
really we have our board of directors and our board of directors may have a finance committee. They may have, uh, you know, credentialing committee. They may have a bunch of subcommittees, but our board of directors is really the acceptance and oversight of the balanced scorecard of the performance improvement progress. So again, everything is rolling up to ultimately at that board level to ensuring accountability across the strategy and across the organization as a whole. The executive management team, again, these are the people that are responsible ultimately for the day-to-day -day operations. Everything in your organization will either roll up to a CNO, a CFO, a COO, a CMO, a CEO, all of our, our C-suite type positions. Now, the goal of the executive management team is to review and interpret the strategy and ensure that the metrics that we are selecting as a part of that PIEC accomplish the broader strategy goals of the board of directors and the institution as a whole. And then the last is our medical executive committee that really comes together and evaluates the clinical processes to ensure that we do not have standards in place that allow us to jeopardize services, to ensure that we're not limiting the services that we can provide as an organization. So again, the complement of all of these different areas. So now we're gonna get into the performance improvement collective council. Now, when we talk about the PIEC, again, this is truly a disciplinary team. Now, when we talk about the members across the PIEC, this is something that I like to see that should be led or co-led between the CFO and the CNO, CNO, depending upon your type of organization. The reason why it should be led by these two areas is because if we look across the history of healthcare, generally these areas have been the most siloed of the healthcare entities. Again, quality does quality stuff, finance does finance stuff. It's also under the realization that most people within the hospital will roll up directly to either the CFO or the COO. Now, the reason why this is not the CEO driving this initiative is because we want the CEO to be thinking more about the broader strategy, external efforts, collaborating with the public, the board, and so forth. Again, laying the framework and driving the overall course for the organization. When we start thinking about a lot of the day-to-day -day operational components of achieving that broader strategy, this really needs to be done by the CFO, the COO, and all of those individuals throughout the hospital. Now, in addition to that, the other members as a part of this should be your ED director, revenue cycle director, QIPI directors, a board member, privacy officer. We also want to pull in two to three key department staff that again, can be a part of this initiative to drive performance improvement. Now, these are really your champion staff. These are the people that other people in the organization will broadly listen to and broadly look at going forward. Now, the purpose of the executive group is to meet at least monthly or monthly to receive the reports from the different hospital departments. Again, those reporting departments and entities. Now, the PIEC is ultimately responsible for setting expectations and driving those performance improvement initiatives, that broader goal, and also tasking the different departments to drive the action planning development. Again, everything rests with the PIEC. Accountability comes down from the board and leadership, but the PIEC is ultimately tasked with pulling together those collective of efforts. Now, what are the goals and responsibilities of the reporting entities? Now, your reporting entities are clinical and non-clinical departments. Now, they could be housekeeping, it could be revenue cycle, it could be emergency department, it could be whatever the different reporting entities are. Those reporting entities are responsible for reporting to the PIEC. Again, the PIEC is one that pulls together all of the different data. Now, when we talk about the reporting entities, we also want to come to the realization that there are major and non-major departments. Now, when we talk about the major departments, these are major departments within the organization, again, such as nursing, emergency department, revenue cycle, and so forth. Non-major reporting entities could be specific focus on certain departments, like physician focus on imaging and rehab or specific improvement efforts. Again, it's working under the framework of all of these different areas. Now, as we start to identify the recognition of improvement opportunities, we have to realize that different things are evaluated differently within an organization. And as we start to rank performance improvement initiatives, particularly under the PIEC, we have to realize that certain initiatives are more important than other initiatives. 
And as we start to evaluate these initiatives, we want to start ranking across different areas. Now, up on the screen are certain areas that we can use to evaluate those different performance improvement initiatives. This is not the end all be all. You can identify different initiatives or different ways to rank these initiatives in a way that is more effective for your organization. But nonetheless, again, we have to evaluate things. Just because something is high risk and gets the highest score in that area, if it gets ones in all the other areas, it is something that we wanna focus on, but it may not be as important as something that gets sixes across every single area. Again, we wanna factor these things in, realizing that different things has a direct impact on the performance of our organization. Now, what are the responsibilities of our reporting entities? And it really comes down to four main areas, indicator selection, target setting, benchmarking, and action planning. Now, the PIEC is, again, responsible for setting those broader goals. The reporting entities are going to establish specific metrics and goals to accomplish that allow the organization to achieve those broader industry or those broader organizational goals. Now, the key is, is that when we're selecting those metrics, it has to be something that can actually be measurable and can actually effectuate change. It can't be something that is immaterial or not going to drive some type of performance going forward. We also have to be able to benchmark those performance metrics. So again, how are we relating? Oftentimes we've seen organizations where they establish a metric and inside the organization, they say, listen, we want to improve this metric from, you know, 5% to 10%, or let's say even, you know, 80% to 85%, we want to improve this metric but they don't take a step back and benchmark that externally to the industry and come to find out if they were going from 80% to 85th percentile, they may still be in the bottom 10% of performing hospitals or entities. So again, we have to benchmark and we have to start to compare ourselves to other entities as a way to see, are we truly performing relative to the industry? And then what we have to do is we have to institute action planning. So what we have to do is we have to identify specific steps and opportunities to drive performance improvement and look at those as ways to start to drive the initiatives. Again, it is an ongoing process. It's not to set a goal and then take a distant approach to how we want to achieve these certain outcomes. So what is the flow of data and the flow of information? Now, when we look at the reporting entities, again, all data eventually flows back to the PIEC. The goal is, is to get everything back to the PIEC so that they can collaborate information for the governance committees, but then also continue to engage the reporting entities around the different services that they're providing or the metrics that they've selected. Again, the goal is to continue to drive that performance improvement initiative. Now, one of the great benefits of the performance improvement committee or collective is the fact that as we start to report, it allows us to realize that because we have merged the entities together and we truly have finance and quality working together across the different departments, we don't have to have every single department report on every single thing month to month. I can tell you that when I was a CFO of a hospital last and we would constantly get together at a department head meeting and we would go around the room and listen to every single department head try to talk about something even though there was no substantive change within their department. So again, by breaking up into this PIEC and realizing that we have increased transparency and the ability to come together, it allows us to take a step back and realize that imaging only has to report every third month. Lab only has to report every third month. Now, again, if there is a substantive issue, it allows you the opportunity to bring forth those issues but it understands that we are tasking each of those reporting entities to ultimately drive that performance improvement and giving them the latitude to drive and report back on a quarterly basis versus having to report back every single month, even if nothing has changed. In healthcare, generally, there is not a month enough that can change month to month relative to certain metrics that would require somebody to report every single month on how they're doing relative to their metrics. For instance, if we have something like revenue cycle, I'll keep using the net days AR, you know, we may make a two day increase or improvement on our net days AR, but again, that may just be because of claims conversion or a couple claims getting paid within a certain period, we may revert back the next month. So again, it allows us to do more trending and more development to gain a better understanding as to how we're performing as an organization. 
Now, the next great thing around the PIEC is because we've come together truly as a collective at that PIEC level, it allows us to start to create task forces to focus on specific initiatives or problems that are impacting our organization. Now, oftentimes within healthcare, you'll go into an organization and they'll create a committee. And then that committee ends up operating in perpetuity and they never shut down that committee, even though it's fulfilled the overall goal of that committee. And it tends just to keep meeting and meeting and meeting. And then establishing another committee and a different committee. And again, it becomes very convoluted and very disorganized around the establishment of an, a performance improvement plan. Under the PIEC, through task force development, we are establishing a specific group of people, pulling in people that can truly effectuate and assess that specific situation dedicated to that performance improvement initiative. It has a finite time. So again, it's not something open-ended. The goal is to assess and drive some type of initiative linked back to that overall hospital strategy. Through that initiative, you can truly start to drive performance. Now again, once that task force achieves what they ultimately try to achieve, you can then disband that task force and then convene a different task force or some other group based on some other performance improvement initiative. Again, it's getting under the realization that as we continue to operate in a rural market, we have limited time and resources available to us, then we have to start to leverage our time more effectively to ensure that we can continue to perform going forward. Now, one thing I will say relative to performance improvement is as we continue to operate as an organization, we have to start to focus on, again, the processes and the procedures and all of those things within our organization to truly drive performance improvement. We cannot make minor or immaterial changes on a day-to-day -day basis and expect to have a substantive change in performance improvement going forward. Now, I know I've gone through a lot of this information very quickly, and again, it was really to lay the framework around a performance improvement collaborative to really start to drive that performance improvement going forward. I'm gonna pause now to see if there's any questions that I can answer around any of these different topics. Again, I know the concept is maybe new to some of us, but it really around the framework of having to break down the siloing of quality and finance into a single performance improvement collective. Thank you so much. Really great presentation, Jonathan. Um, we are moving into our Q&A portion of the session, so please remember to enter your questions into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can also raise your hand and I will unmute you. I have a couple of questions for you, Jonathan. Um, the first one is, Beyond CEO, CFO, COO reporting, how does the board of directors re remain in its role and objectively know the health, morale, and functioning of the organization? Uh, what's the objective lens? What does that look like? Uh, and how does it avoid the unfortunate surprise of, <clears throat> excuse me, learning the organization is breaking down? Looking for examples. So I think the key is, is, is one thing is you have to, you can invite different board people to different committees. You know, oftentimes I, I've seen it where boards are very much at the governance level and don't get involved in the day to day. On the inverse of that, I've seen where boards are extremely involved in the day to day. And, and, and frankly, that would just personally drive me crazy if I was still in hospital leadership and had to do that. But what I would say is it, it really comes down to transparency of information. Um, Boards, what I've seen across the country is if they feel that they're not getting adequate access to information around the financial position, direction, overall strategy, they will start to drill down more and more into the operations until they can start to get that information. Now, what I will tell you is when boards start to get very much into operations, it's very hard to reverse that trend. Like if they're getting into having constant conversations around what providers are doing or what services we're offering or why we're offering these days per week, getting them out of those conversations and back to a governance approach is, is very difficult and I would say a lengthy process. So I would say it's having staff that can, that can effectively you know, discuss the operations, having a finance person that can walk through the financials and understand the nuances of reimbursement and understand the nuances of healthcare and all that. It's having a CNO that can talk about and answer their questions when they present questions relative to 
to clinical care. Because when we look at boards across the country, most times they're asking specific questions because, particularly in small communities, because a neighbor, a friend, or somebody said, hey, I had a problem at the hospital, what's going on? So it's, it's being able to answer all those. It, it really comes down to the transparency of information and giving them the information that they can actually make decisions. Thank you for that. Um, another question is, and you covered this quite a bit in your session, but what do you see as the best approaches to getting started moving toward a culture of accountability in an organization if you've been in either the forced accountability or no accountability structure? Um, and do you have some real world examples of where you've seen stumbling blocks along the way in terms of getting um, buy in? to this new accountability structure? There, there's always stumbling blocks. <laughs> um, it's something that's not going to change overnight. You know, there's we've worked with organizations in Massachusetts and Virginia and, and again on the West Coast and Arizona and so forth to really implement like a culture of accountability. And, and that it takes trust in the leadership to realize that you're going to have setbacks but in the long-term goal, the long-term outcome is beneficial because you're going to transcend the organization. Um, oftentimes, we like to jump back to the punitive or the forced or, 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 or revert back to the way it was. And what I would say is it's you can't get to a culture of accountability if you don't engage staff and let them know what is going on and what you're looking to accomplish. So what I would say is one of the biggest barriers to this is is we say we want to go to this culture of accountability, but then we ask staff for their opinion or for their thoughts, but then we ignore everything that they say and still force something within, you know, what we think is right. And, and that's, that's not going to ever get you to where you want to be. Now, it's not to say that we have to listen to our staff all the time, because again, they don't have access to all the information to make those decisions. It's just the inherent within the nature of, of the business. It's being able to take the time to explain why we're doing things and the logic behind what we're looking to accomplish. So long as we can do that and we engage staff around the nuances and why we're pushing in a certain direction, we'll start to make those improvement efforts and we'll start to get the buy-in. Employees will not feel vested if they feel like they're either ignored or you know their, their opinions just go in here, one out the other. We have to start to engage them and have them feel like they have a say in where the organization is going. Well said, thank you. Um, I do not see any other questions in the chat. Um, we'll give it another moment, um, but I will go through and do a couple of announcements um, and also want to remind folks that as soon as you log out of the webinar, you'll be given a survey. Uh, and we ask that you just take a couple of minutes to fill that out so that we can continue to provide uh, programming that meets your needs. Um, and there's also CE available if you uh, fill out the evaluation as well. Um, so Jonathan, can you please move to the, yes, that slide, thank you. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to share a few announcements from the Office of Rural Health with you. Uh, the first is our forum on aging is coming up May 15th through the 17th in Seaside. Uh, registration is open now, um, and we hope to see you there. We're also um, hosting at the same time in Seaside a CA quality workshop, um, which will start really late on the, the 15th for kind of a happy hour and then go the 16th and 17th all day. Uh, and registration for that is also open. Um, the link is in the slides, which I'll email to you all on Monday. And then our next webinar with Jonathan is ensuring long-term success uh, today, the 2023 Revenue Cycle Strategies, which will be held on April 20th at 12 p.m. Um, again, if you uh, would please, before you log out, uh, take this the survey. Um, we would really appreciate that. Uh, let me just check and make sure we don't have any other questions that came in. 